What if that nagging feeling in the back of your neck was real? What if those hands reaching out from the dark that you believed were there, were there? What if the monster in the basement really existed? And what if there was really something under the bed? Would you have the courage to face your fears? Welcome back to Fear. In this week's episode, Paul and his squad have been separated from their unit. A mission that was supposed to be a quick in and out has gone completely foobar. Stay tuned to find out what unfolds. I had to really give it a thought, but did my grandfather say the zombies had set up an ambush? I've read a lot of books, but I've never heard of a zombie being able to do much of anything except eat and die. I'm hooked to these journals now. I've got to know what happens next. November 2nd. 2020. We were able to hold the perimeter last night without much of an issue. The zombies must have lost our trail when we took off from the grocery store. We have tried to reach out to Drum but haven't had any luck. We also have not been able to get a hold of anyone from our unit that left yesterday morning. Sergeant Kelly is trying to hold it together, but you can tell he's worried the base might have fallen. All I can think of is my family at this point. I've recommended that we head back to base, but even I know that it's going to be a suicide mission if we don't find a vehicle first. We aren't sure what these things are capable of anymore. No one else seems to think that these things ambushed us, but I swear, I heard one of them yell. Hopefully I was just hearing things, or maybe it was just one of the other soldiers that yelled for the attack. It doesn't matter now, though. All that matters is we find a car and head back to Trotton to make sure everyone is safe. Luckily, my kids have their family there with them, in case things have gone sideways. Since none of us know how to hotwire a car, we need to find a dealership. The closest one I could think of was the shitty time buyers up the street for me. The only issue with this plan was that that was the direction we had came from the day before. But since we didn't have any better ideas, we went with this option. As we exited the house, the eerie feeling of being watched sent shivers down my spine and made the hair on my arms stand on end. It felt like there were eyes everywhere and they were hungry. I shrugged the feeling off and tried to keep my mind on task. We stayed off of State Street to avoid being completely out in the middle of everything, but the problem was that we just had no cover. These were long roads with very clear sight lines. This would have been ideal if we had the upper hand, but obviously we didn't have that in this situation. The carnage was unbelievable with blood almost everywhere, but the biggest problem was that there was no bodies anymore. The only bodies I saw on the ground looked like they had suffered from gunshot wounds to the head. I wonder if this has something to do with the zombies seeming to become smarter over time. I made a mental note of it and moved on. Luckily I'm keeping this journal, or I'd probably have forgotten half of the things I was seeing. This was like a total sensory overload. Death and decay was everywhere. There were a few major car accidents on the road, but luckily we were able to make our way around them relatively easily. We were about a block away from the time buyers when we spotted our first zombie. It looked like he was dragging a body instead of eating it. We ducked behind a building when we saw it and we didn't hear any reaction coming from that direction. Sergeant Kelly poked his head around the building to see if it was still there, but didn't see anything. We waited a minute to make sure the coast was clear and started heading forward again. After spotting the zombie, we were all completely on edge. Why was it dragging the body? So many damn questions without answers. I had to shake it off and continue scanning my sector. We could see time buyers now and it looked like there weren't any zombies there to deal with. We checked to make sure it was safe to cross and went across the street to clear the dealership. Luckily for us, the doors weren't locked. It looked like whoever was here during the initial outbreak got the hell out of Dodge and didn't bother locking up. Not like I could blame them. I would have done the same thing. We spotted a Dodge pickup in an SUV and decided these would be the vehicles we'd take. I used to work at a dealership, so I know how to find the box that they kept all the keys in. The only problem was we didn't have the keys to get into the damn box. I told the guys to scour the area to see if they could find the keys. The guy who took off probably had the keys. I asked Sergeant Kelly what he wanted to do and he asked if he could crack it open. I told him it was possible, but it would make a lot of noise and possibly bring more of them. I figured a screwdriver might be a better option so that we could pry it open. It would still be a little loud, but not half as loud as smacking the the buttstock of my rifle against the box until it opened. The dealership had a little mechanic shop that was connected to it, so we'd need to clear that out until we could find the screwdriver. While we were about to head out of the main dealership building, we saw three more zombies also carrying bodies. This time we were close enough to see what they were dragging. It looked like some of the guys from our unit. One of the privates in our squad almost tried to make a run at them, but he was held down by Sergeant Kelly. He told the young man there was nothing he could do for him now. The best thing we could do is keep our damn head down. The soldier's muffled cries could be barely heard while he was pinned down. Once we felt like we waited enough, Sergeant Kelly let the private up and told him to try and keep it together. The young man shook it off and apologized. 
We were all holding up so much stress that we were starting to get to us. Once that was handled, we went to the small shop and grabbed the screwdriver we were looking for. The shop looked like it had seen better days. There were a few bodies pinned under cars with their heads smashed. A severed hand was still holding a wrench in what I assume was a last-ditch effort to fight for his life. We grabbed the screwdriver and got the hell out of that horrible place. The salesman must have seen what happened before the mechanics because the showroom was almost untouched. You could tell there was a disturbance at one point and that people had left quickly, but it definitely didn't feel like the place had been touched by the end of the world. I had two of the soldiers go check the VIN numbers of the two cars we wanted because I figured they'd be on the tags. I then went to pry open the box, and as I was able to crack the box open, a fucking alarm went off. I had no clue that a dealership would have their key box hooked up to a damn alarm. The alarm was deafening, and I yelled at the soldiers to tell me the VIN numbers so we could grab the keys and get the hell out of there. Just as the first soldier was telling me his number, Sergeant Kelly opened fire on whatever was outside of the building. A couple of the other soldiers started firing as well. I grabbed the keys of the first car and the first soldier went up to hold off the invaders. The second soldier told me what the VIN number was for the second vehicle, and I yelled at Sergeant Kelly that we were good to go. He ordered the two privates to grab the keys and go fire up the cars. They grabbed the keys for me and I told them which ones they went to. I finally got a chance to look outside and I saw that it was an angry mob. The issue was this angry mob was all dead and looked like they had missed a few meals. The mob ducked under cover from the hail of gunfire and Sergeant Kelly yelled to everyone to hold their fire. I couldn't believe these things were hiding behind cover to avoid the bullets. Did they retain a part of themselves from their prior life? I didn't have time to think about it. We continued to try and keep their heads down while we made our way to the cars. A couple of the zombies popped up and tried charging up while they thought our backs were turned. They were greeted by a volley of fire that almost took them off their feet. I hopped in the truck with Sergeant Kelly, and one of the privates that had grabbed the keys was in the driver's seat. We had three others in the SUV. We were completely surrounded because this parking lot only had one way out, and that was the direction the zombies were coming from. I yelled at the private to the floor and we ran through the zombies. Luckily there were only about 30 of them, so we hit maybe five on the way through. The SUV behind us also made it through and blasted off down the road. We had a straggler on the side of the truck, and Sergeant Kelly had to smack it off with the buttstock of his rifle. I could have sworn it yelled at him when it was smacked off the side of the truck, but I could have just been hearing things again. I mean, they're going crazy. These fuckers are really starting to talk. With that shit show in the rear view, it was time to head straight for drum. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Lost Generation. Come back next week to hear the fate of Fort Drum, 